With this PowerPoint, we will begin thinking together on developing a personal rule of life. The term rule of life comes to us from historic Christian tradition, uh, particularly out of monastic life in the early days of Christianity. A very favorite scripture of mine for this kind of work is the early verses of John 15, uh, verses 1 to 11. I am the real vine, and my father is the gardener. Every barren branch of mine he cuts away, and every fruiting branch he cleans to make it more fruitful still. You have already been cleansed by the word that I spoke to you. Dwell in me as I in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself, but only if it remains united with the vine. No more can you bear fruit unless you remain united with me. I am the vine, and you are the branches. Those who dwell in me as I dwell in them bear much fruit, for apart from me you can do nothing. Those who do not dwell in me are thrown away like a withered branch. The withered branches are heaped together, thrown on the fire, and burnt. If you dwell in me and my words dwell in you, ask what you will, and you shall have it. This is my Father's glory, that you may bear fruit in plenty, and so be my disciples. As the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. Dwell in my love. If you heed my commands, you will dwell in my love, as I have heeded my Father's commands and dwell in his love. I have spoken thus to you, that my joy may be in you, and your joy complete. This text gets many things right. It shows us the right relationship for our spiritual growth. We are not the vine. Neither are we the gardener. We are a branch only. And as this wonderful image from nature shows us, a branch gets life-giving energy for a while. It grows. It produces good fruit and then it withers and dies away. So we can also think of the dynamism of our own spiritual life, that in certain areas uh, we are deeply inspired, uh, we work with those areas for a while, we live with them, we grow with them, and then perhaps those tasks come to completion and we need to look for new ways to have our life in Christ invigorated. So we're going to be working with a sense of dynamism of God's calling to us as well as our own response and the changes inherent in our own life. These principles are carried forward in a wonderful way by thinking of that dynamic growing uh, and asking as we inquire into the text and use this metaphor, this image of the grapevine, what is growing well and producing good fruit. We can take this as a general life review as we think about developing our rule of life, and I would encourage you to uh, spend a half hour with these questions as you think on your life uh, journey at this time. What is growing well and producing good fruit? What is growing well but could use pruning to be more fruitful? And what is dead wood? What attitudes, what uh, tasks are no longer life-giving? And finally, what's ready to sprout? I've used these questions and this text not only for personal reflection, but also for corporate reflection with a congregation as they examine their various areas of ministries. And I've found that if we begin with this positive dynamic of what is growing well and producing good fruit, we discover that people are very ready and happy to name the dead wood, the things that are not working so well, our attitudes that have become hindrances for them. A very fine resource for thinking on the rule of life is Marjorie Thompson's book, Soul Feast. She discusses many different spiritual disciplines, as uh, we will be exploring a bit later in this presentation. Uh, in the last chapter of the book, she describes this definition of a rule of life. A rule of life is a pattern of spiritual disciplines that provide structure and direction for growth in holiness. I took her use of the term holiness here to be broader than the sense of the holiness stream of Richard Foster's material. Uh, it is that whole sense of growth in our relationship to self and God under the pattern of Christ. 
Ordinarily, a rule of life would be developed with a spiritual director on an annual basis. You would review all areas of life, your intellectual life, your emotional life, your spiritual life, your practices of spiritual disciplines, your work life, your work sense of personal vocation, and develop this pattern so that you could grow through the year. I also like to think of a thinking of this rule of life as something we may want to adjust on a seasonal basis. And we're going to begin to practice that with you this semester. Uh, toward the end of the semester, as you develop your rule of life, we're going to also encourage you to begin thinking about the summer to come and whether there would be some adjustments that might be interesting to make for you. An important place for us to start in reflecting on our rule of life is, as we discussed some last semester, what is the aim of Christian life? Do you take it to be an imitation of Christ, both in the sense of growing into fullness of life, but also in the capacity for suffering in Christ's name? Or perhaps you are a part of one of those streams of Christianity which really holds that the claim of Christian life is to be incorporated, to work corporately in the body of Christ, of the believers, of the church. In Eastern Orthodoxy, there is a term hesychasm, drawing on the image of the peace that passes understanding, which I like to link with the Hebrew tradition of shalom, uh, getting things in right relationship in all of our relationships throughout the world so that there is a sense of righteousness and peace reigns. Hesychasm means inward and outward peace. Uh, and it is a challenge for us to think, have we ever really aimed uh, toward the peace of Christ as an abiding way to live out our Christian life? The term sanctification that we use in Wesleyan theology and its Catholic term divinization both derive from Latin terms uh, sanctus holy and divinization God from God to mean growing in fullness of relationship with God. There is another term out of Eastern Orthodoxy theosis that speaks of this growing into union with God. There are many very lofty aims and hopes for the image of human salvation. I find it refreshing to simply come home to a very simple and extraordinarily high aim in Wesleyan theology that the aim of Christian life is to be made perfect in love in this life. As persons developing our roles as Christian leaders, it is very important to cultivate our own sense of spiritual life. Remember these words from Bernard of Clairvaux, written in the 12th century in the 1100s. If then you are wise, you will show yourself rather as a reservoir than a canal. This is an image of water and the reservoir holding the water to be built up until it can flow over rather than a canal in which the water flows straight out. For a canal spreads abroad its water as it receives it, but a reservoir waits until it is filled before overflowing and then communicates without loss to itself its superabundant water. In the church at the present day, 1100s, 2000s, we have many canals, few reservoirs. So urgent is the love of those through whom the streams of heavenly teaching flow to us that they wish to pour it forth before they have been filled. They are more ready to speak than to listen, impatient to teach what they have not grasped, and full of the presumption to govern others while they do not know how to govern themselves. Give them to me out of your surplus. If not, then spare me. It is really important for us to have a systematic way 
of renewing ourselves in all ways, physically, mentally, emotionally, spiritually, so that we may do this high work that Christ has called us to. So Marjorie Thompson's definition uh, speaks to us even more clearly now. A rule of life is a pattern of spiritual disciplines that provide structure and direction for growth in holiness. She speaks of this pattern as a trellis, that it creates the structure over which the vine may grow. The flowering vine can grow up from the ground over this trellis, this pattern of spiritual disciplines to give us structure and direction for our growth in holiness. She quotes from William Paul Sell, Athletes, musicians, writers, scientists, and others progress in their fields because they are well-disciplined people. Unfortunately, there is a tendency to think that in matters of faith, we should pray, meditate, and engage in other spiritual disciplines only when we feel like it. I want to really ask us to ponder one of the inherent challenges within our Christian understanding of the dynamics of grace and works. We have an inherent problem in which uh, we may overly emphasize the role of grace rather than our own effort and what is required of us in a disciplined way to avail ourselves of the grace of God. And that will be part of our work together to create a rule of life in which we do that kind of ongoing development. You'll find that we're using rule of life really in two different ways. Uh, one is personal, and we've been discussing that as we think about varieties of spiritual disciplines. But there is another way to use the term rule, and that is to think of the large rules, the big rules that are inherent in Christian life. Uh, these would be, for example, trying to live after the ideals expressed in the Beatitudes or the Lord's Prayer. One of the major rules of Christian life has been in the Rule of Benedict, which talks about organizing daily life around two kinds of work. The word opus means work. The opus dei is the work of God or worship which came to be known in the format of the daily office. And from the early days of monasticism forward, this could be as much as seven times a day to gather with the community for worship. Uh, many people today use a kind of modified daily office, for example, pausing for prayer three times a day. The other opus, the other work, is the work of the hands, opus manuum, uh, manual labor, what it takes to keep life going in a physical world, uh, whether that is f cooking the food or growing the food or taking care of the structures or building the buildings. Uh, it may have been offering hospitality to those who come to a monastic setting. In our time, I like to think of the Opus Manuum in two ways for the life of the church, and that is as both administration and direct acts of ministry and social justice and care. The th other aspect in these Latin terms is Lexio Divina, Lexio meaning reading, Divina the divine word, reading, study of scripture, the Lexio Divina. And undergirding all of that, a spirit of hospitality. We have the rules of the Methodist societies. We have a rule such as the Order of St. Luke, which talks about living the sacramental life, devoting oneself to a modified daily office and to attending to the sacraments as much as one can. Some may want to think of the Ten Commandments. As we develop our own personal rules of life, you will discover a section that says, what is the big rule that you are using? For some, that may be simply one scripture verse.
To explore that theme further of the distinction between grace and works, I like to reference John Wesley's sermon, The Means of Grace, which we had in our resources last semester. This sermon was written at a time when a movement called quietism was sweeping across England and the Methodist societies. And quietism, based on certain scriptures, made the assumption that one could not do anything good unless you were inspired by the Holy Spirit. So there was an assumption that one would wait, uh, that faith should be somewhat passive while we await inspiration. And as you know, if you've studied anything about John Wesley, this is totally alien to his character. And he wrote this sermon to speak of what is the proper relationship between our attending to God, making ourselves available to God, and our own actions. Uh, he uses a scripture which is the one where the children of Israel are fleeing out of slavery from Egypt. They approach the Red Sea. The water does not part. The water does not part. Moses said, come on, let's go. And they go into the water. It begins to come up to their noses before the water parts. And Wesley says, based on this scripture, how should we wait upon the Lord? By marching forward with all our might. And he suggests that the ways that we wait upon the Lord are then to be active in seeking out what he speaks of as the ordinary means of grace. And this is also a very helpful image to say that God's grace is not limited to these ordinary means, but these are simply the ordinary ones that the church provides regularly for us we can meet God in many other ways than in these means. But we should avail ourselves of public prayer and private prayer, attending the sacraments, reading the scriptures, holy conferencing with one another, being in small groups in which we are able to explore the understanding of the faith, being in relationships that we call spiritual direction or soul friends to talk about areas of significance to us. And finally, fasting or abstinence. And as we think on our own rules, we may well want to devote ourselves in some way to this fundamental structure. The rules of the Methodist societies then, uh, based on some of these principles out of Wesley's sermons, really speak of the big rule of loving God with our, our heart and soul and mind and strength and our neighbor as ourself. So there's great attention to avoiding doing evil in so much as we are able to do so. And it's very fascinating to read the specifics that were identified in Wesley's time, such as doing nothing that would contribute to the slave trade. Also, we need to take in context the admonition to avoid spiritous liquors because there was great public drunkenness happening in this time of social dislocation. Also, one of my favorites is about not uh, going to fight physically with someone who is also in the societies. We are dealing with a very rough crowd and a way to begin to live civilly together. Then beyond that, to do good, to give one's charity to one another and to take care of the neighbor, to visit those in prison, to visit those who are sick. And finally, to attend upon the ordinances of the church which are those ordinary means of grace we have just been discussing. In recent years, uh, the rules of the Wesleyan societies have been given uh, this really fine graphic representation in the work of Covenant Discipleship by David Lowe's Watson, Gail Turner Watson, and Stephen Manskar. So we have works of mercy, our works of loving the neighbor, and we have works of piety, our works of inward spiritual practice. Those also evidence in both private, personal ways, 
and public ways. So pulling all this together, uh, we can make one way of articulating our rule to be what are the acts of devotion to which we dedicate ourselves in our private spiritual life, what are the acts of personal compassion, one-on-one uh, -on -one generosity, practicing that spirit of hospitality in all that we do to one another. And in the more public domain, what are our acts of public worship, and what are our acts of justice, of care for injustice institutions, of care for those through the way our society administers its justice to one another. As we begin to think on our rule of life, we will also be mindful of the challenges of our particular life structures. Uh, I would commend to you again an article that was in last semester's uh, packet on uh, from Ernest Boyer Jr., Away in the World, Family Life of Spiritual Discipline, in which he talks about the spirituality of the center, our life in family, our life in the world, uh, our life with one another in relationships, and spirituality of the edge, those ways in which we take time to be away, to be in retreat, to be in solitude, uh, if you will, to be in Sabbath. And the great need we have in our time for learning means of balance. Also, I suggest you look again at Dietrich Bonhoeffer's statement on meditation, daily meditation. And remember his injunction that we need to meditate daily uh, as Christian leaders to guard ourselves from the unseemly haste and disquiet that would endanger our work in ministry. Well, remember, this was written in the mid-1930s. There were no cell phones, there were no texts, there was no email, there was no assumption of instantaneous communication with one another. Uh, we are just learning, barely beginning to learn, how to live in healthy ways with this new technology before us. Uh, you may want to think about a fast from media for some periods of time as a part of your rule of life. As we try to bring these disciplines that really were cultivated at the edge in the monastic orders very much into the center of our common daily life in families, in relationships, in communities. Marjorie Thompson's Soul Feast uh, draws all of these different spiritual disciplines together under these themes. Uh, devoting ourselves to spiritual reading, such as the Lexio Divina, our public life of worship, our time of personal prayer, cultivating a spirit of fasting, uh, which might be very specific from time to time, the work of self-examination, confession, awareness, some of us will do that through journal writing or other forms of self-reflection. The need for soul companions, perhaps seeking out a formal relationship of spiritual direction or working more informally uh, with one or more soul companions. And finally, undergirding our whole life, a spirit of hospitality uh, in our homes, in the workplace, in the neighborhood, at church, and in our civic life. And as we reflect upon the uh, rancor that is so visible in our public civic life these days, it occurs to me that hospitality uh, becomes yet again a hallmark of Christian life and one that we need to spend serious time thinking about, devoting ourselves to, and learning how to live in peace with one another again. A wonderful form of the examine or that practice of self-examination or examination of consciousness or conscience is offered by Marjorie Thompson in these words, addressed to God, when have I been aware of your presence, guidance, or grace 
and how did I respond. I particularly like to put the time frame in parentheses. Uh, we can do this on a daily basis. We can do it, as suggested here, on a weekly basis. Uh, this is one of those wonderful practices that I tend to uh, put aside and then pick up uh, perhaps every season. Uh, to say, for example, uh, this past fall, when have I been especially aware, God, of your presence, guidance, or grace, and how did I respond? Second question, when have I been especially unaware of your presence, guidance, or grace? And try to determine what has been a hindrance. And finally, uh, this lovely language, what habit of the heart do I need to acquire in order to live more faithfully? I'm very fond of this term of Marjorie Thompson's because habit of the heart could be a practice. It could be, oh, I've neglected my prayer time again and I need to get my habit back. It could also be an attitude. It could be a process of uh, inner life that's very challenging to us that we need constant vigilance to kind of stay attentive to. What habit of the heart do I need to acquire to live more faithfully? In your study materials for this week, there is a PDF I copied out of uh, Soul Feast, which gives some examples of rules of life. When Pope John XXIII was a seminary student, he included the following elements in his rule. 15 minutes of silent prayer upon rising in the morning. 15 minutes of spiritual reading. Before bed, a general examination of conscience followed by confession then identifying issues for the next morning's prayer. Uh, what a lovely idea. This is the first time I've ever seen that, where as you prepare for sleep, you are actually also preparing for prayer the next morning. Arranging the hours of the day to make this rule possible, setting aside specific time for prayer, study, recreation, and sleep making a habit of turning the mind to God in prayer, that would be like a spirit of continuous, constant prayer. A different rule was developed by Catherine de Hook Doherty, the Russian baroness who founded Madonna House in Ontario, Canada. Drawing on the Russian hermit tradition, she recommends a monthly retreat into silence and solitude for a 24-hour period, a true monthly solitude retreat. Dorothy Day, whom we know in her great work in social justice, who began a ministry called Houses of Hospitality for the Poor in New York, had this rule. She received Eucharist daily, read the Bible daily, and kept a journal that was for her a form of prayer. She saw Christ in the faces of the poor. And then here is this rule developed by Martin Luther King junior to guide the nonviolent protest of the civil rights movement. And you'll see embedded into it some very strong specificity. Meditate daily on the teachings and life of Jesus. Remember always that the nonviolent movement in Birmingham seeks justice and reconciliation, not victory. Walk and talk in the manner of love, for God is love. Pray daily to be used by God in order that all might be free. Sacrifice personal wishes in order that all might be free. Observe with both friend and foe the ordinary rules of courtesy. Speak to, seek to perform regular service for others in the world. Refrain from violence of fist, tongue, or heart. Strive to be in good spiritual and bodily health. Follow the directions of the movement and the captains of a demonstration. You will find a template uh, that is a Word document that you can work on. Uh, just download and begin to work on it to develop a rule of life. Uh, there are many ways to do this. This is just one form that we've been using with the seminary for a number of years to kind of give everyone a general idea of how to begin to develop this. And it begins with uh, another quote from Marjorie Thompson, the rule of St. Benedict views balance in human life very seriously. Times of common and private prayer are balanced. The daily rhythm of monastic life provides a balance of exercise for spirit, mind, and body, prayer, study, and manual labor. We need to consider such balance as we choose disciplines to structure into our daily lives. 
Each of us needs a balance between personal and corporate disciplines. Each of us need practices that help us look to our own hearts and practices that help us forget ourselves in meeting the needs of others. When the Spirit is freed to do its work, these disciplines work together in mutually sustaining way. So we want to begin this work by reflecting then on three questions. What of the spiritual disciplines am I deeply attracted to and why? Uh, and let me say at this point, you may already have a very fine uh, devotional practice uh, that is very effective for you. We're not suggesting you need to change anything. Uh, perhaps that is the uh, discipline that you will want to continue to develop and list in a predominant way. Uh, but there may be some prayer practices that you've been learning about that it's time to experiment with and, and develop in some new ways. And here is an opportunity to think about that. But then not only what feels comfortable that we are attracted to, but what do we think might be calling us to stretch and grow and to note those and then to spend some time uh, devoting ourselves to this enormously difficult question, what kind of balance do I need in my life? You'll see after spending some time reflecting upon these that then you will turn to naming the big rule that you are going to use as a plumb line to kind of hold yourself uh, over and against. And I want to encourage you to go ahead and uh, open up and look at my sample rule of life that I developed uh, last spring, last summer, excuse me, and have been working on from time to time uh, through this time. You'll see some of the areas that I'm suggesting for myself uh, attend to both these areas of attraction and areas of stretching. We then have a kind of a uh, listing of various disciplines uh, to explore and look at in your own life uh, in the area of worship, in the area of personal prayer and reflection. When we think on the issues of the world, uh, how we will respond, what is most uh, upon our heart in these days, uh, what will we refrain from doing uh, in order not to do harm. Uh, how will we pray? How will we serve? How will we order our financial donations in order to support these concerns? Then we move into other areas, the life of study. For many of you, that is fairly articulated by the seminary education process. Uh, in your family life, your physical self-care, this personal issue or attitude could be something like Marjorie Thompson's issue of the habit of the heart that might be important. You'll see in my own rule, I have uh, continued to work on a spirit of presence in peace and love uh, to deal with my own uh, kind of inherent uh, impatience uh, challenges that come upon me in terms of anger and uh, difficulties uh, of injustice and how to handle those uh, as I bounce off of the Beatitudes as the big rule. Finally, think about bringing this together in terms of who are the persons with whom you will engage in holy conferencing. Uh, do you have a formal spiritual direction relationship? Uh, do you have soul friend or friends? Uh, do you have a covenant group? Your spouse may be one of those persons. Uh, I like to think both in the area of formal spiritual direction, but also soul friends. And you'll see on my rule of life, I am very privileged to have two soul friends with whom I meet regularly. Uh, one is a acquaintance of some 40 years that uh, we have a phone call about every six weeks and another is a person I meet with in person every month. Uh, we devote an hour to one another uh, and have that spirit of soul tending each to the other in a very regular way. And how frequent will this accountability be? 
Finally, uh, you're likely to put down more than is possible to do. So go back and highlight those key areas, and you'll see how I've marked that on the rule of life that I've shared with you personally. This is very important that we also have a spirit of what is manageable and doable. As we conclude this presentation, I want to offer a blessing that comes from John 15. Would you hear these words coming to you from Jesus as you ponder and pray uh, on developing this rule of life? As the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. Dwell in my love. If you heed my commands, you will dwell in my love, as I have heeded my Father's commands, and dwell in God's love. I have spoken thus to you so that my joy may be in you and your joy may be complete.